There's an interesting verse in um, Hebrews chapter 8 that says, from the least of them to the greatest. And I was thinking about that, and the Lord's really been stirring me up lately. The first service really was just me repenting. It was, it was a lot of my repentance, honestly, of just how I had like deviated from Jesus. And this last, I don't know, it's been a while, it's been a progress, but definitely in this last week, two weeks, the Lord's really been tugging on my heart about getting back to like the reality of who I am and the, the message, my life message, whether I'm on a platform or not, like just my life message, the way I live my life, he's been getting me back to that place. And I was, uh, we had that video with the kids And I was just thinking, you know, the disciples, they're walking with Jesus, living life with Jesus. Nobody knew him better than they did. And then along the road, in their journey, as they're going to a different town, they're arguing about who's gonna be the greatest in the kingdom. They're having a dispute amongst themselves about which one of them will be the closest to Jesus in kingdom come. Which one is gonna be in the place of greatest elevation like, who, who is he gonna elevate? And Jesus, hearing them and knowing their hearts, he just grabs a little kid. In my mind, I like to think this kid's probably like five years old or something. Just like a small child grabs him and says, I'll tell you who's gonna be the greatest. This little kid. This little kid's gonna be the greatest. And if you become like this little child, you too can become great. And I'm just thinking about my own life and <clears throat> ambitions that I have. And God has really humbled me because honestly there was so much of me that wanted to be in this place. I so badly wanted this stage so I can share my revelation, so I can share what God has shown me. And it's just a big pile of dung. It doesn't matter. What I have to say doesn't matter. My, my voice doesn't matter. Jesus' voice matters. What he says is what's important, not what I have to say. And you, you probably already have all of this revelation because you know him. Like, you don't need me to tell you things, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Okay. Jesus, the way that he lived his life was completely countercultural to the way we live ours. If you think about what he did, he could draw in the biggest crowds. He could draw them in, but he couldn't actually keep them. If you look in scripture, Jesus could not keep crowds. They would leave. They would hear about what he could do for them, and then after that, they would leave because he would say something that they didn't like. And today I'm noticing in the church especially the Western church, not over in the foreign mission field, but in the West, we have kind of a monotone God. He's speaking one tone. He's speaking one kind of a love language, and it's the, oh, Father God loves me. Oh, he loves you, and don't get me wrong. None of this is not true. I'm just saying, we focus on one tone. But when I read the Gospels, I don't hear one tone from God. I hear manifold tones. I hear tones I would never want to be receiving. That's how Jesus spoke. He would be the one who would just scoop up like the woman caught in adultery. Everybody's trying to stone her and kill her and he's the one standing in between saying, if you're without sin, then you go ahead and you throw the first stone. So he's obviously that loving, that, that, the one that's protecting us, but then there's this other Jesus that looks and sees the crowds and he's not impressed. And instead of saying something that would keep them, he says something that would cause the chickens to leave. Honestly. And he says, okay, we'll see what you're made of. You must eat my flesh, and you must drink my blood, or you can have no part of me. And then the crowds leave. And then he turns to his disciples, the 12 closest people in his life, the ones he's given everything to, his best friends on the earth. And he says, go ahead, 
now is your chance. Would you like to leave me as well? You can go now if you'd like. You can go. And I wonder, do I live my life where that's what I'm using to draw people in? Like the purity of Jesus? The genuineness of Jesus? Does that make sense? Like in your life, like what is drawing people in? Are you, are you so f- focused on trying to gather the crowds and keep the crowds and keep the people? And, or are you just like, at the end of my life, I'm going to stand before the king. And he's going to say one of two things to me. One, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Or two, he's going to say, depart from me. You worker of lawlessness, I never knew you. Like it really doesn't matter what other people have to say. We can hear so much world-class preaching and teaching and such amazing teaching, but how many of us go to this first? Honestly, like it pains me even, honestly I don't even like being up here and I so wish there could be like a, a curtain so you couldn't even see my face. I don't want you to look at me because what I have to say is, it's, it's, it's nothing. I'm just trying to point to Jesus. And I've realized that in my own life, as I'm a snotty mess wreck this last week, laying on the floor all the time, because I've realized I've forgotten about Jesus. I've been so focused on the Father's love, and I've been so focused on doing the stuff, the healings and the miracles and all these testimonies and everything that God's doing, that I forgot Jesus. I left him behind. I mean, if you look at the Corinthian church, this was a church that was doing everything. They were doing everything. They were healing the sick. They were getting so many people saved. There were signs, wonders, miracles exploding in the city because of them and what God was doing in them. And yet, Paul has to write two letters to them because they're so skewed and they've so left Jesus behind. They've been doing all that, yet they've been adopting the principles of the world and the city that they're living in. They've been meshing them in and bringing them in to their own, their own church life. It's like the church life became this duplicitous thing. And so Paul had to write this letter when he's, here's Paul, a man who knows way more than we could ever know, far more than we could ever know. He studied the scriptures for longer than we've ever studied. He spent so much intimacy with God, Holy Spirit became his teacher, and even he says, I'm gonna put all of my knowledge on the shelf, and I'm only gonna preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, and that's it. And then he's dealing with all these problems that these churches are having, and it's like, when you understand that, you can read the epistles and realize Paul is brokenhearted over what's going on, He doesn't want to address the problems. He doesn't want to keep talking about the basic stuff. He wants to talk about the purity and devotion of Jesus, and that's all he wants to talk about. If you think about this, how many times did Jesus teach a model to heal? How many times did he teach a model to his disciples on how to cast demons out? How many times did he teach a model on how to prophesy over people? Did he tell them the way to preach the gospel? I think if he did, we probably would have had it in the Bible. I think we probably would read in the gospels these models because these are God-given models. And hear me, I'm not saying a model is wrong or bad because God has made our minds Our minds are a beautiful thing to him and he creates ingenuity and causes it to come out of us. But I'm saying this, I wanna ask a question. Are our models actually because we have a lack of faith in him? So we use them because we still wanna see God's kingdom advance but we just don't know how. So we fall back on our model. We fall back on, I need steps to breakthrough in my life. I need steps to transformation in my life. The book of Hebrews is all about you don't need any steps. That's the whole book because that's what the Old Testament was. That's what the Old Covenant was. Steps, processes, things you must do in order to become who you're supposed to be. The book of Hebrews is about no more steps. 
No more models. No more nothing, just Jesus. Just Jesus, just Jesus, just Jesus. Hebrews 8 is the hinge. It is the linchpin of the entire book. Jesus only, always only Jesus. That's what, the, that's what chapter eight is all about. It's, we've talked about it before, about he's a, he's a better high priest and he's a high priest of a better covenant. And that's the majority of what this chapter is about, but it focuses in on what this new covenant actually is because it says that this new covenant was enacted on better promises. And so I wanna focus on what the better promises are that God has enacted this covenant with. And so in verse 10, it says, for this covenant, I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. there's really just a few things that hold this new covenant together. There's a few promises that will never ever change and they're right there for us to see. It says that he's gonna put the the laws of God, God is gonna put his laws onto our minds. It says that he's going to write them on our hearts. If you go back to Psalm 119, it's the longest psalm in the book of Psalms And each psalm starts with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet and then it goes through a song to the Lord. And the song, each song, is all about new and different ways that David meditates on the law of the Lord and sees that it is good and pleasing and holy and perfect and lovely. He's writing all of that and singing all that to God because he's trying to ingrain what embodies God, the law that's embodying God, the the access that we have to understanding the spirit of the law, like who God is, he's trying to ingrain that on his mind. So he's meditating on scripture. He's, He's renewing his mind with the truth of who God is. But we have something better, because Paul says that we've been given the mind of Christ. It doesn't mean we stop meditating. It's that David was picking up on something that was a new covenant promise before the new covenant, and he started putting it into practice. It's it's supposed to continue. The practice is supposed to continue where we just meditate like, oh my gosh, God, you are so good. You are so lovely. You are so kind. You are so generous. I love your laws, God. I love the, like it says that the boundaries have fallen in pleasant places for me. Like the way that you take care of me it's not having a disdain for what God wants to do and, and parameters that he wants us to live our life in. It's freedom. Amen. Like, that's what it means to have the mind of Christ when we're renewing our minds by speaking truth about who we are and whose we are. And then he says he's gonna write it on their hearts. In Ezekiel, he prophesied about a new heart. He prophesied about a new heart that God was gonna give to his people He said he would take out that stony heart, that heart that's so calloused, so hurt, so in pain, so desensitized, and he's gonna remove it. He's not gonna leave it in you. He's gonna remove it. He's gonna put in his own heart. He's gonna put in his heart inside of us, one that is a heart of flesh, one that's tender, one that can know and experience God, one that can relate to God, one that can connect to God, when we recognize that maybe we're having a hard time connecting with God, it's not that God hasn't given us a new heart. It's not that he hasn't done what he said he would do. It's not that he hasn't fulfilled his promise. It's that we will let things creep into our lives that have caused a callous to be put over our hearts. And the promise that God has is to break through that, to take off that callous. I just want to stop for a second. Do you guys realize that we're not promised anything else? Like what we have right now is a gift and we're not promised anything else. Like would, I was asking myself this this week, would I be okay 
if like it says in Psalm 103, all these benefits that God has, would I be okay if I never got to experience all of those again and all I had was Jesus? Would I be okay? Would my faith still be intact if I had nothing but Jesus? I'm praying for that breakthrough in that situation. If it didn't come, is my faith shattered? Is, is my life over? Because I didn't see that breakthrough come? Does any of this make sense? Are we getting that? Like, how much of our lives are wrapped up in his benefits and not him? How much of our hope are we putting in the fact that he's gonna heal or he's gonna do this thing or that thing or we're gonna pray for that and that's gonna happen? You know that there is a little bit of a, uh, what would you call that? A stipulation in what God is gonna do. He says that if you abide in me and you let my words abide in you, then ask anything in my name and my Father will do it. Everything is in, in the Christian life is holding intention. It's not either or, it's both and. Amen. Scripture is full of dichotomies. But I will say this, if, if we're not reading our Bible and then we're going, Lord, do this in my life, do this in that person's life, do this, and we're not even reading this, do we really know him? Honestly, do we know him? The disciples didn't have this. What, what, what would they be like if, if they actually had this? This is so precious. This isn't legalism. This isn't living religiously because you're like, I'm sorry, I can't hang out. I have to spend time with Jesus. I need to read today. This is not being legalistic. It's not, like it says that the word became flesh. The word of God. The word of God became flesh in Jesus. It doesn't mean that we, we stop reading this because now we have Jesus the person. It's like, you want revelation in your life? Read your Bible. You want to prophesy more with accurate words of knowledge? Read your Bible. You want to see every sickness crumble beneath the feet of Jesus? Read your Bible. It's about becoming the word. Incarnational ministry. Your life is incarnational ministry. You are heaven sent. You are an ambassador for the king of kings on the earth. This is not your home. I've been thinking about kingdom come versus kingdom now. Again, hold everything in tension. It's not either or, it's both and. But unfortunately for me, it became an either or. And I became so focused on kingdom now, I forgot about kingdom come. My life began to just be about ministry. Gotta heal this person, get that person saved. I wanna see some demons cast out. I, want, I wanna see the kingdom come right now. I gotta see it, gotta see it, gotta see it. To where then it turned into also better finances. Also, I want to have success in this life. Also, I want people to, to hear what I'm saying. I, I hope, Lord, you use my, and it sounds Christian too. Lord, I hope you use my words and my message to really uh, you know, build your kingdom. What that means to me is, oh, I hope I get to do itinerant ministry. Oh, I hope that like, I get to get on bigger platforms and bigger stages. But really, in my heart, I'm thinking, oh, just such a pure heart, like, God, I just want your kingdom to come. I just want your kingdom now, Lord. And he's like, yeah, but you miss me. You want what I can do for you. No, you don't want me. And I'm just asking us this morning, like, is that the condition of our hearts? Are we like, do we want what he can do for us or do we want him? Because if we try to understand everything, if we try to figure everything out, we're gonna be disappointed and we're gonna leave our faith because it will not make sense to us. It will never make sense to us. He says that he will be their God and that they will be his people. And then he says, they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, know the Lord. 
for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. Again, holding everything in tension, I'm not saying that teachers are bad because I'm up here teaching (laughs) and we do it a lot. It was a gift. Paul writes that some were given the gift of being an apostle, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors. They're gifts that God gives. But when anybody who's a teacher is sharing, if this is all like, oh, brand new news to you, then you've missed it. It's not supposed, I'm not supposed to come up here and share something new that you've never heard before. I'm supposed to come up here and share something that's encouraging to your heart because it encourages you on the journey with a revelation that you already got to know because you've been face deep in the Bible and the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you and illuminating his very words of life to you that whatever I have to say, it's just like, oh, thank you, I'm on the right track, like, I've been learning this, God's been teaching me, Holy Spirit's been teaching me, I didn't need another teacher, I'm so grateful for that teacher over there who just confirmed what the Lord's been speaking to me. That's how it's supposed to be. That's why it says that you will not be needing to teach your neighbor or your brother saying, know the Lord. You have the Bible. You don't don't need me to tell you how to know the Lord. Again, that gets back to the whole model thing, like, what, what, what are the crutches in our life that are keeping us from Jesus and him alone? Because we can go to, we can go like, oh, Father God, this is so amazing. Father, I just wanna see your face. I just wanna know you better. That's an amazing prayer, don't get me wrong. But look at what happened when the disciples said that. They said, oh, Jesus, just show us the Father. And I don't think that Jesus answered back in like a, oh, guys, oh, I I thought you knew this. That's okay. I think it was more like, oh, have I been with you so long and still you don't know? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If we've seen Jesus, we've already seen the Father. And the more that we see Jesus, the more we will see the Father. You don't have to ask to see more of the Father because the Father said he has elevated the name of Jesus above his very own name. It's Jesus that gives the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus who sends and fills believers with his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is only on the earth to replicate Jesus on the earth. Jesus is supposed to fill the earth. That's what life with Jesus is supposed to be like, becoming like him being conformed in his image, being made like Jesus, always only Jesus, never anything else. And he says, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Really, that's just forgiveness. Jesus is, or what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is that the answer is Jesus and it's his forgiveness. But we're supposed to put that into practice. Think about this. Jesus went up to Calvary. Scripture says that he was marred beyond human recognition. That means he didn't even look like a person. He was so mutilated. He was so crushed. You wouldn't even be able to recognize him. And he's there hanging on the cross And everybody around him who came didn't come to weep over his death. They came to mock and make fun of. And in that moment, while he's naked, hanging on a cross, marred, you wouldn't even recognize him. He says, Father, please forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. If we have been given, according to the new promises of the new covenant, the mind of Christ, if we've been given a new heart, and the Holy Spirit put within us, we're becoming like Jesus, that means we need to let go of our justification of being justified in when people hurt us and people offend us and people do harm to us and people accuse us. We forfeited that right when we said yes to Jesus and his justification for us on the cross. Think of it this way. We're all pre-forgiven. So that means That means you wake up in the morning and you go, oh, good morning, Lord. Good morning. 
Um, I'm just so excited to be in your presence this morning. I just, I'm so in love with you. That's nice. Um, yeah, I just, I can't wait for what the day has. Like, I just, I love you. I praise you. I worship you. I give you my life. Well, you do right now. Well, what does that mean? Well, you're gonna do something terrible in 10 years from now, and frankly, it's affecting my mood. So <laughs> I'm pretty upset about that. But I didn't do that yet. Like, I, I love you. Like, I'm, I'm your kid. You're my father. Like, oh, I love you. Yeah, well, you love me right now, but just give me some space because this is really frustrating me. I can't believe you would turn away from me like that. I can't believe you would do that. But I haven't done it. Can't you prevent me? Nope, nope. See how silly that sounds? So silly. But that's actually a lot of times the way that we think and a lot of times the way that others think. 2 Corinthians chapter five talks about the ministry of reconciliation. It says that God, through Christ, was reconciling the whole world to himself, not counting anybody's trespasses against them. That means when he went to the cross and he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they're doing, he's saying, forever and always, I've pre-forgiven, I have done the ministry of reconciliation, they are reconciled back to you, now the ball is in their court if they wanna step in and enjoy that. So that's the standing that we have. So how can we demonstrate that to other people? So somebody hurts you, somebody speaks evil against you, somebody slanders your name, somebody really, really hurts you. How will you forgive? How long will it take to forgive? Because the sucky thing about forgiveness is that Once that happens, since we gave up our rights to justify our hurts and our pains and our offenses, since we gave that right up on the cross, we need to forgive. That's why why the disciples, when, when they're talking with Jesus and he's talking about forgiveness, he says, you're supposed to forgive. They say, look, what if they come like seven times in the day and they hurt us? You need to forgive. In fact, you need to forgive 70 times. Like just keep forgiving on forgiving on forgiving. And they're like, oh, give us faith. That's their cry, give us faith. But think about those times when you messed up, you hurt somebody, and you went to them, and you're just pleading for forgiveness. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. Please forgive me. And how many of those times are you met with, it's okay, I love you, it's all right, water under the bridge, I know it's a big deal, but it's water under the bridge, and I hold no ill will against you. Versus how many times it's like, oh, I forgive you, but give me a while, I need to cool off, because I'm upset. I would just beg each of us, please, <clears throat> if you're gonna forgive, I'm not saying you don't need your time to process, I'm just saying, why don't you take that time before you forgive? Because when you forgive somebody, that's it. Because when Jesus forgave us, he said, it is finished. It is done. We're supposed to be like Jesus. We're supposed to just be so in love with him that literally nothing could ever shake us. Like we were singing about, build my life. I will build my life on you. Talking about how he's a firm foundation. Like this morning, the the verse that came to mind is like, if you will fall on the rock, you know what I'm saying? Those people who would fall on the rock versus those who will be crushed by the rock. Like, that's what I thought of this morning when everybody's up here in the front, just on their faces, willfully falling on the rock, being sweetly broken in the presence of God, being broken upon Jesus versus later in life when you have to be crushed. And it's not like a, I hate you. It's like a, I love you so much. This is for your good. He's not interested in parts of him living inside of us, or he's not interested in parts of us living inside of us. He wants all of us being him. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. and It is no longer I who live, but it's Jesus who lives in me. Like we're supposed to give up our rights to have our way. 
It's a definition of love. Love does not insist on its own way. You gave up your rights when you said yes to Jesus. This is the love that the world is longing to see right here, that we would, we would believe these better promises, that we would live these better promises in our life. If we were to live these, the whole world would get saved. People would see that purity of love, even if they disagreed with different ideals and different points here and there. They would, people are just overcome by genuine love. 